My name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm an associate professor in our uh, the Weatherhead School of Management and also the executive director of our um, Beal Institute um, for Entrepreneurship at, on campus. And we're thrilled um, to also be partnering with uh, Professor Lena and her students as part of her entrepreneurship course. And today's moderator, uh, Hamsa, we were just catching up before, is a master's student who's um, originally from India and been in the U.S. Uh, for uh, just a short amount of time, but we're so thrilled to have her on campus and be moderating the session. Um, I will go on mute, and um, Doug, my colleague, will be here and, and helping Hamsa uh, coordinate session. These sessions are best when everybody's asking questions, so um, we really want to hear from you uh, and you know save your best, hardest questions for Julie. We'll put her on the spot and um, really look forward to the conversation. So with that, uh, Julie, thanks for doing this. And Hamsa, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Michael. So uh, first of all, I would like to welcome Julie today for today's session. Thank you so much for joining in today. So um, without, my, as Michael has given you, uh, give it a very good intro. And we now know how, how well you guys know each other. So I just thought I can proceed further with the session today. Um, so... First of all, um, you know, with our prior interaction before I just thought, you know, I had a couple of questions in mind that I really wanted to discuss with you. And I'm ho I hope my classmates will all and the other view students would also be benefited by these. Um, but most importantly, I would like to encourage everyone to ask some questions so that, you know, it keeps the conversation going on. So first, um, we all know that you're a health, you're a grad student from healthcare and operations. So what do you think would be a most important quality or an asset which a healthcare manager should possess in the work environment? So, uh, you know, I, and so first of all, great to be with everybody today. Um, I hope I can be helpful in expanding your thinking and uh, contributing to whatever you might be thinking about um, educationally or professionally. And thanks, Michael, for having me and for everyone else who's put work into this. Um, so uh, it's a great question, and I would say that um, when I, I've worked a lot over the last decade with leaders in the industry, so I look at this question through the lens of what it takes to be a great leader in healthcare, and uh, no matter where you are in your career, starting to really uh, embody the characteristics that get you there, um, or get you to where you want to go, right? That's not always necessarily to the top. Um, and uh, in healthcare in particular, uh, I would say a few things. One is certainly empathy, and that empathy is for um, you know, the people like us who end up being um, members or patients or the like, and empathy for those who are providing care. And I say that mostly because um, <laughs> coming from the operations lens, um, I hope that we're doing more and more every day, especially now with the pandemic, to actually um, operate our care provision better. Think about how we provide care in ways that are more user-friendly to all of us. So you have to be empathetic and really understand uh, the complexities that are dealt with on the front lines today and how to think in a really um, forward-thinking, innovative way about how to make that experience better. Thank you. So, um, well, uh, that gives us a detailed insight. So how do you think, how would you say from your personal experience, how have you developed these qualities right from the scratch, like as a, from being a fresher to an entrepreneur now, how would you say the transition journey? Like, how do you describe, how do you, how have you, how has these qualities improved and rather, you know, you have, you would have definitely, definitely developed them on a higher scale. So how do you recommend that? Well, um, you know, the first thing I'll say is I really, uh, early in my career, I was wondering whether I should go um, back to school and go get my doctorate or go get a clinical degree. Uh, and I met Michael uh, when I was in business school, so uh, took a pretty different path. But part of the reason I did that was, uh, first of all, organic chemistry killed me. But second, um, I had the opportunity early in my consulting career to work inside the belly of the beast of health systems. And there's nothing more humbling than really seeing um, how care is provided, how many people are involved in the process, how much technology is used, um, uh, how, the, the, how the place functions, honestly. 
Um, so that provider experience really helped, um, helped me understand how to use that as a jumping off point. Um, and I, you know, I had a somewhat meandering career um, in the sense that I've been trying to uh, look at how can I have the biggest impact on fixing the system? Where can I contribute? So that's been my North Star um, as, I guess, an executive, you could say. Um, and along the way, I looked at it through the lens. I've wanted to learn how does policy work and what, what role does policy really play? Um, how does philanthropy work? Uh, part of my career was um, starting a consulting firm focused only on philanthropic organizations to try to get them to think about how they use their money more strategically. And what I learned actually is philanthropy does amazing work, but it's never very strategic, nor does it ever scale, um, which might be why I'm back in business today. Uh, so I, you know, I've been on the business side of healthcare the entire time. And for me, it's really been about learning different ways in which major stakeholders who either have a lot of money or a lot of power play in the environment um, to try to really build those characteristics of uh, empathy and kind of solution orientation. Is that helpful, Amsa? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's awesome. Um, so uh, just adding on to that question, like you were saying that you had a doubt that whether you wanted to continue with your uh, PhD and so on and get into research. So how would you think, like if you had taken that choice, how do you think you would have, um, do you think that it would have been even more better or it would have changed your line of action or? How do you think that would have impacted your career? You know, I think that there's a lot of personal choice in this answer, to be honest. Um, I have a number of friends who are um, MDs who have, and I'm sure you all may know someone like this, who have rolled out of practicing care and into some sort of business side of the industry. And um, I think that's a, it's a very tough decision for someone who has spent so much time pursuing a clinical degree. And I think you either love the human interaction of health and uh, you either love that human interaction of health because you love this, the science of it, or you want to figure out how do we actually get ourselves out of this acute care system and into a more preventative system. And that pulls you back, unfortunately, into, gosh, what are solutions here? So I think I probably, um, you know, th I'm not so sure what, how it would have changed my path, except for the fact that um, there's a tremendous amount of good that can be done um, at the clinical side. And we're not, there's nothing more important right now as a realization from the pandemic than the need for research and research in very different ways. And the fusion of um, public health and the healthcare system, right? If we haven't learned, if we've learned anything in the last year, it's about our downfall there. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it, it really is about whether you want that human interaction in the care setting, or you want to be focusing on thinking about how to impact a lot of people, but not, you know, quite so one-on-one. -on -one. That's nice. Uh, so we have a question from Rachel. So uh, she has asked, can Julie tell us more about what she does in healthcare? What is her background and how did she get? Where is she now? It's a very good question. I'm sorry I didn't start there. So, um, you know, as I spoke earlier, uh, spoke to earlier, my career has really been one where I've been trying to focus on how do I make the biggest impact? And uh, I so today, I'm a partner at an investment firm called Transformation Capital, and Transformation uh, is in its second fund, $500 million, focused exclusively on digital health innovation. So everything we invest in has to have some sort of technology at its core and needs to be at a company that's actually trying to push the market towards more of a fee-for-value um, place and not just continuing to support the fee-for-service environment. That being said, because we're investors, we have to time that market right. So some of this is incremental and some of it can actually be game changing. Um, so how did I get here? <laughs> um, the meandering way I took was uh, I started off as a consultant, which puts you in a very kind of generalist category and gives you a perch um, to see multiple things, not just super functional. 
Um, I did that before and after going back to business school. Uh, and then I jumped into a small innovative company, about 100 to 150 employees, and tried to really um, use data, this very early days of using data to improve quality of healthcare. So what AI does today, we had a bunch of humans and a database that did 20 years ago, way ahead of our time. What I learned there was that small companies that are ahead of their time have a very hard time changing huge um, instantiated industries. Uh, but we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the convergence of some of that happening now. Um, but I took that experience and started a consulting from my own focus on philanthropy. I already talked about what I think about philanthropy's con contribution, which is fantastic, which set me down the road of policy to try to figure out, um, gosh, how does, could policy be a place I could, I could contribute here? How does, how does that work? Um, and I spent time, for, I was very fortunate to spend time in D.C. Uh, as the stimulus package was being passed and as the ACA was having its run up. And the firm I um, was the managing director for, you know, much like many firms in D.C., did a lot of work to infuse language into some of those bills. So I saw how all that worked. And what I decided was that I don't have the personality or the patience or the, frankly, interest in reading 800 pages of legislation and trying to interpret them. Like, I just can't do that. I'm a people person and I like to talk about the big vision. So um, the beauty of me in that role was uh, once we had all the policy folks who translated all that stuff, I would then come in with my team and look at, gosh, what are the business implications for the farm industry, for health plans, for health systems, et cetera. And that was an incredible learning experience to really understand where policy stops and where the market takes over. Um, and you know, my next stop after that will then make the rest of this story make sense. Um, I then joined a capital, uh, private equity firm uh, that was focused on healthcare as well, although a little bit broader, um, and really saw how uh, capital can make an enormous difference, but you either need to be working for a huge firm or you need a lot of firms on the same page about certain things. That's not sort of how capital typically plays, but I ended up inheriting this conference uh, that was billed to me to be a CEO conference. And I piled on and I uh, basically built a conference business within this uh, private equity firm that ended up actually being quite successful. So we ended up spinning it out as a separate business. And I spent my last decade building relationships um, with CEOs and C-suites of the largest health systems, largest and most innovative, I'll say, health systems, health plans, pharma companies, um, and government officials as well, as well as the CEOs only, and there's a reason for this, of the innovative companies that are really changing the game. Some are disrupting, some are just helping advance the industry. And my whole vision was if we can facilitate strategic collisions, if we can put the right types of people together and get the right relationships going across health plans, health systems, pharma, now remember, healthcare loves its silos. Like we'll do anything to just live within our silo of comfort. So I broke. I tried to break that in our environment, um, and we we had a number of transactions, partnerships, and relationships that came out of that decade of work, uh, and really was the premier convening of those that level of executives. So. Um, I'm now taking that back to a capital platform and trying to look at unique ways we can not just with our own fund use those relationships, but develop a cross fund platform to frankly try to drive more diversity of every type through our companies and other companies. And uh, also drive really forward thinking about where the industry needs to be, but nowhere where any investors really putting money today outside of some kind of wealthy seed folks. Um, to really try to make the industry better through these companies, these small companies that are growing and making an impact in the, you know, the huge um, incumbent industry. Uh, so I'll stop there because I've spoken for a long time, but uh, uh, you know, for me, these different platforms play different roles and I've learned so much um, in that approach. And if, it, if there's anything I would say to you, um, something very early to think about in your career is whether you want to be a generalist 
or a specialist. And if you look at the story I just told you, I have put myself in the position of being a journalist at every point along the way. And I've, I've been fortunate and I've just been in some pretty interesting positions to be able to, to develop some of what I've done. Um, but uh, I also have plenty of friends and colleagues who are just rocking the specialist roles. You know, they're incredible um, operators of all sorts of different healthcare um, companies. Uh, they're doing incredible like medical work as CMOs or even data science work, um, which requires a lot of scientific understanding of healthcare, frankly. So there's, there's a lot of ways to think about, um, you know, where you want to be. And I think that specialist versus journalist question is something you should keep in mind at every point that you're making a decision about your career. Because it's hard to be a journalist and actually then go back and be a specialist. That's sort of the point. I just I'll stop there. I just had a follow-up question to what you said. Um, I was wondering why you only work with CEOs. You made a mention of saying that it's you only interact with them. Great question. So um, the goal was to, you know, there are plenty, this is really a conference business question, to be honest with you, um, strategy question. There are plenty of conferences out there. I mean, there used to be <laughs> about a million conferences for managers and below, salespeople, um, they become big parties where people go spend time and, you know, get a lot of work done. And um, what I tried to create was really something where the leaders got together because I felt like if you can get that level of CEO and C-suite together who are decision makers, who see the long, who take the long view um, and need to drive the direction of the entire organization, you could do something powerful by bringing those folks together. Um, and the only reason the CEOs of the small companies were there was because, you know, these small companies, um, you're not going to keep the large companies around very long if you have everybody from the small companies there. It's really only the CEOs who uh, can potentially even convince a health system to buy their product. <laughs> That's my point. Is that helpful? Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, great. Um, next, we would like, uh, we have Mark with a question he wants to Mark, give me a unmute yourself and go ahead with your question. Sorry. Um, hi, Julie from Washington, D.C. Uh, so as one of those D.C. people who was doing policy and advocacy work, both uh, domestically and globally uh, in the private and public sector and with uh, NGOs internationally as well, uh, I wanted to ask you from a different point of view, how can consumers and advocates as well as policymakers better engage with the entrepreneurial sector to uh, forge alliances and partnerships to some of these emerging uh, streams of uh, doing business that we're talking about that you've worked on uh, for so long. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a great question, Mark, uh, because it's a part that's a little bit broken at the moment. Um, I'm on the board of NCQA and part of my role there has been to really try to encourage them to bring as many of the entrepreneurial companies into uh, the work groups that they run around quality or some of the new areas that they're exploring because even NCQA, well, I shouldn't say even, NCQA falls in the trap of only working with the big plans and the big providers. So first, I think a lot of associations in DC would benefit by engaging leaders in some of these innovative categories because they're doing, I think they're doing things out there in the field that are not always um, top of mind or known in some of those associations. Um, you know, policymakers, uh, it's a complicated thing. I've seen, you know, under the Obama days with Anish Chopra and um, Todd, Park and some of those folks um, who are working in the White House and uh, HHS, they did a great job of uh, really leaving the door wide open for entrepreneurs to come in and educate them. And policymakers, those particular policymakers also did a lot to push data out of the government so that entrepreneurs could actually really use the data, learn from the data, make their products better, or even create products based on the fact that now CMS makes a lot of data available on its membership, right? In the right ways, of course. So I think exposing data and embracing entrepreneurs um, is something that we should be continually doing. And I think if you look at healthcare.gov and how that got fixed, 
it was fixed by embracing a lot of Googlers, right? That's pretty much the bottom line. So we know there's a lot of talent out there in the hinterlands and we need to take advantage of it. I'll just end on consumers is the tough one, to be honest. Um, I have felt for a number of years that uh, consumer presence um, is there in so many types, AARP, um, National Women's and Children's or whatever that group is called. Um, but it's, uh, it doesn't feel authentic necessarily um, in, a, in the way that it engages on behalf of the consumer. So there could be a lot more done by some of those organizations like AARP used to run an innovation lab uh, that I think was actually really effective. It got companies to focus on seniors. And many of those companies had never focused on seniors before. And companies were literally started because AARP brought visibility to their population, to their segment. So perhaps that's the way to be thinking about it. I don't know if it's an innovation group like that, but it's um, bringing visibility to populations. I think if healthcare is at any turning point right now, it's at many. <laughs> but one that's really important, Mark, to your question is um, healthcare is starting to segment populations in discrete ways where we can actually really take action, where policy can be developed, where companies can be created and scaled, and where solutions can actually meet where consumers are. And we haven't been there for a long time. Ever. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Mm -hmm. uh, just, just very briefly, uh, this, this begs the question for me personally, I'm looking to move into working with foundations and philanthropic organizations, but what role do and what are the successful, besides the Gates Foundation, for instance, foundations that are engaging in this and how might they, they fill some of that void with consumers too? Yeah, so one of my favorite foundations um, which is not an enormous foundation, but I think has a pretty interesting model is the California Healthcare Foundation. Are you familiar with them? Yeah. So what I've really appreciated about CHCF is that they have um, developed programmatic areas that are linked from what's the policy position and advocacy platform to what's the work in the field that can get funded to really demonstrate to, they've also been running an innovation fund for the last 10 years that tries to attract companies that may or may not be working in the Medicaid and underserved populations and giving them, uh, you know, uh, some sort of financial transaction, whether it's a, um, a loan or some, you know, some very free money. If you're a company and you're looking at equity or CHCF money, CHCF money is very easy. It's not going to dilute <laughs> your ownership in a company. Um, and they've gotten a lot of companies to actually come in and work with safety net organizations. They'll also grant the safety net organization so that their uh, the safety net organization and the innovator are aligned um, in the work that they're doing. And then, then that innovator is creating a solution out of that that can scale to far more people outside of California potentially to others in the Medicare population to the extent that there's relationship, right? So um, I, I, I like that model and I'm not seeing a ton of other foundations be that progressive. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes, thanks for being with us. Okay, sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, so anyone uh, else have any questions if you have anything to ask? I'm curious how many of you um, are on the biology side versus the business side. Is there kind of a science? science. Okay. I think the majority of us here are. are. Um, and how are you looking at what's happening um, with shifts in research and design and kind of commercialization um, with the pandemic and what's been accomplished? Because we're seeing from the transformation capital perspective, we're seeing um, a resurgence of the use of digital tools in ways that um, have been talked about in life science for a long time, but you know, uses of AI that have really gotten us where we are on vaccines and uh, just new creative thinking about how to reach people with uh, technology tools to get vaccines and arms and things like that, um, that the life science companies are doing. It's not all, you know, not all the government as we've seen. Um, 
uh, does any of that interest you or is it worth discussing in any way? Um, uh, before that, uh, we just have a question from Dr. Chakravarti. Um, um, I'm looking for um, some kind of a suggestion. I'm a, just a, basically a scientist and now turned into a teacher, basically. <clears throat> I worked in the pharmaceutical companies in, for 10 years, um, startup companies, but I'm not, I don't have any skill in business. Would you please give some suggestions to these young people who want to continue in entrepreneurship based on your experience? Sure. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think about where the best place would be to start. <laughs> um, you know, first I would say, uh, I don't know if this is too basic, but um, the importance of internships and experience, um, are, it's just, it's unmatched. And uh, the, you know, the ability to try to get some practical experience in what you're studying, I think is so important. You've found people who have um, jumped ship from what they were studying because they felt like their practical experience was not actually what fed their soul. So, um, you know, I think that's, really important. Um, you know, uh, when I think about entrepreneurial experience, um, <laughs> Lena, let me ask you a question. Do you look at that question as a, um, how do you assess companies just to join? Um, how do you think about if you're a scientist looking to start a company? Um, what's the right framing there for me to think to think about? What are, uh, the question I'm, I'm answer I'm looking for, uh, if you can suggest some uh, cons and pros, what they should do, what they, sh they should not do based on your experience. That's what I'm looking for. As entrepreneurs. As entrepreneurs, because they are going to face God knows what um, hurdles, nobody knows, right? But there is some basic um, norms, some basic <clears throat> pillars they should follow. That's what I'm looking for. Do you have any experience or any kind of advice? Yeah, so let me try to frame it in ex an experience that I had. Um, I, for a handful of years, sat on the UCSF um, uh, kind of clinical transformation group where they were trying to uh, commercialize solutions out of UCSF. And there were a handful of us from many different backgrounds, clinical, business, finance, et cetera, mm -hmm. to look at applications to this program. This program would give money um, uh, to uh, you know, a researcher um, or a duo of some sort to help them figure out if they can develop this into a concept that can get scaled in some way or commercialized as a business. Mm -hmm. And what I saw there was that uh, there were a lot of amazing ideas that came from the bowels of UCSF, right? So this is where, where care is happening. Um, and a lot of those ideas were already commercial ideas. So the first thing to know is there's a lot going on out there. Mm -hmm. So if there are idea, if you have an idea and you're trying to patent it, um, or develop some sort of you know, IP or asset around it, it's so critical to really try to understand how to landscape the industry or what resources might be available to you um, to quickly understand if there are you know, people like me, collect a few people like me um, who have access to uh, what, what's happening with companies out there. Um, it can save you a lot of time in either deciding that your idea shouldn't be pursued or in really tailoring it to something that's quite differentiated in the market and not like what's already out there. Um, the second thing I would say is, uh, you know, beware of uh, what you give away as you start to really look at developing a venture. Um, it's, you know, the, the best companies have never been invested in as uh, 
for with institutional investment because uh, we as investors do take a chunk of equity for giving you money. So uh, if you, you know, really thinking through what the business model is and what the business model scenarios could be and working with some folks who you might know from uh, the business school or others in your life who are business oriented, um, really important to get some of that, uh, that knowledge base in so you understand how to approach that. Mm-hmm. Um, third, I would just say it is a lot of work. I mean, sure. starting these companies, it, it's hard. And there's this line that I see all the time in our business with companies that have multiple founders that then really get down to the founder who's kind of making it all happen. There might be two. Um, the political issues that are created when you have a couple founders and one becomes a CEO and one becomes something else and how you live through that. Um, and uh, knowing how far you can get that company. I've seen founders take a company all the way to a huge public company. Most founders um, really need to step out of their business at some point and let more of the professional business operator come in to really scale that company. And what it's what it, what it's about is not necessarily a skill set or the ability to learn. It's about timing the market. If you have something that actually really has product proof of concept and you could actually scale it, you need to scale as fast as you can to really get that to the market. So on, you know, this thinking will probably be a little bit more on the digital technology side than it is on the scientific side, right? And I recognize that. Right. Um, but, you know, I think the, for an entrepreneurial venture, it's all about timing the market, which I think is, you know, it's true of uh, creating a molecule or creating um, creating other assets that are not necessarily just your traditional company. Is that helpful, Lena? Do you think? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would like to just add one small part to Dr. Chakravarti's question. So um, you spoke about uh, from the entrepreneurship side and as well as, as well as the research side. So as a CEO of the company, what skill, uh, skills or how, do you, how would you look at your employees? Like in a sense, what qualities must they possess or what assets must they possess in order to be a better leader in the future? Great question. So, um, you know, every leader needs to have their North Star, decide what is important to you and what, um, what you really need to accomplish and always measure up every decision you make to what that North Star really is. I've already talked about empathy um, and that absolutely is a a characteristic for leaders. Uh, I think we're learning a lot over the last couple of years about the importance of transparency and leaders who can be very transparent, even, even if news is bad. Um, how you can really be a good communicator. Um, and I think authenticity as well. You know, we're finding a lot of leaders today who are really able to help their companies through these very challenging times um, because they're sharing personal stories. They're sharing personal stories about COVID or about racism or just about their own vulnerabilities. You know, I'm starting an um, a article series right now on female leaders and what we can learn from, and this is not just about female, I think um, any type of diversity that's not necessarily white male um, is what I'm going after here. What's What we're seeing from leaders in this period of time around COVID is going to be very indicative to how we see leadership over the course of the next decade. And the vulnerability is the part that I've been most kind of struck by in my interviews um, of female leaders so far. So, you know, I think it's what, what I would say to that is um, 20 to 30 years ago, we would have said, oh, those are all very female skills. Those are the, those are the soft skills. Those aren't the hard skills about how to operate and how to, you know, manage the finances and da, da, da. Those aren't the metrics. Those aren't the KPIs. Um, I think at the end of the day, we're finally seeing this mix of a respect for the fact that uh, you need a, an array of skills, but you also have to understand who you are, right? So the most important thing I think a leader can be is humble to understand who they are and recognize that if you can have a rock star compliment to somebody on your team who 
might intimidate you because they know more than you, but is your best partner ever because they make you and the company better because of their being there. That's, that's the kind of leader that is going to really make success. And I'm seeing fewer and fewer of the top down my way or the highway leaders get the respect that they used to get. Absolutely right. I agree with you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that uh, answer, uh, Julie. And I would also like to ask you, like you were talking about some of your article series, right? Have you, uh, do you have any previous articles or some resources which you can share it with all of us? Um, you know, I do have, a, I can share a couple articles with you. I should do, I'm sorry, I should have done that before. Maybe we can do that right after this. Sure. Um, uh, and I can share a couple titles of books um, that we shared. You know, one of the things I started at Health Evolution, which is my last decade, a um, couple of things that are indicative just to get you to think about how to use um, uh, uh, leadership advisory, if you will. Um, we started a women's event called the Confab that was um, adjacent to our main event that was not just for women. It was for women and men to look at very classic issues through the lens of women and how they dealt with them. Um, very instructive for the men who came. Like I, I got incredible feedback in ways that made me realize that this is not just how we're putting together health plans, pharma companies, and health systems all in one room. It's about how we're putting together different types of leaders and actually putting them in situations where they learn from each other. We also started a leadership institute uh, and it was a year-round program um, that pulled together uh, kind of those who were on their way to being CEO, who were recommended by their CEO. Uh, so I could pull some books and articles from that. Um, I guess Doug and Hamso, if you'd be willing to do a little circulation. Um, but a lot of what we talked about in that group was also um, the importance of uh, things like journaling. Uh, it felt very fluffy at the time when we went down this road, to be honest. Um, but uh, we really structured the journaling in a way that was really about these leadership characteristics, about where they wanted to be, about their retirement speech. What do they want that to look like? And how can that really help shape how you actually plan your career? I mean, there's nothing like thinking through your retirement speech to discipline you around what you want to be known for and what's important to you. Um, so uh, those kinds of activities, I think, were really useful. Um, the other thing I'll say is uh, the next article I'm about to publish is on uh, CEO of Christiana Care in, De in Wilmington, Delaware. Her name is Janice Nevin. She's incredible. And um, the one thing that Janice said, uh, I asked her about, you know, how did you cope personally with all that your organization's been through? You know, her organization, um, first of all, that's where Biden got his vaccines, but um it, you know, they, they're a level one trauma center and they basically built, you know, a 180 bed hospital within their hospital to just deal with COVID. She was very forward thinking about how to really segment what was needed operationally within her organization and, you know, tons of frontline trauma and, and community trauma. The number one thing she said that really got her through was her playlist, her song list, and I'll be publishing what her song list is. Um, so, and she shares her playlist uh, with her entire executive team, and it gets written about in you know some of their newsletters and things like that. So, what I love about that is that here is a leader who's willing to kind of expose um, her personal song choices. Like, your music taste can say a lot about you in a way that's very exposing. Um, you know, so uh, I'd encourage you to think beyond just the structured article and book reading, and also to really look at what's driving human beings um, in their ability to actually lead um, and, and build companies and the like. I mean, there's nothing scarier than trying to figure out how, going back to the entrepreneurial question, how are you going to make money doing what you want to do? Like, where does that money come from? The most important thing I've always asked entrepreneurs for years is, okay, so who pays you for this? How, how are you going to get paid? And after you deplete as much of that market as you can. In other words, you sell into as many, you know, let's just call them pharma companies as you can. What's your next, your next customer? Who is the next group who's going to pay you? And that's something that's really important to think about in entrepreneurship because it's so fun to think about companies you can build, 
um, but you need to get paid. Well said, that's a very, very important, uh, I would rather say an entrepreneur never gets paid, whereas the employees get paid a lot. <laughs> okay. That's one way I think. Yeah. So um, from your experience, uh, so you you have definitely, you know, had a wonderful experience. What do you think would be a personal insight which you would um, recommend to us who, who are planning, who are planning or who may plan to become an entrepreneur in the future? But um, something uh, like, you know, which you would strongly say, you know what, this is, if you just remember this, you're going to be for sure in the right path. Um, well, I'm going to have to go back to the, I'm going to say two things if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, uh, the less inspirational thing, I'll, I'll try to end on the inspiration. Um, the less inspirational thing is uh, when you're embarking on some sort of entrepreneurial venture, uh, it's very easy to, first of all, you have to be scrappy, right? It's very easy to build in ways that are not sustainable. So one of the best things you can be thinking about as a company of one or a company of three or a company of 10 is when and how do we build infrastructure? How do, you know, with the number of companies I see that are small companies that use Salesforce, I should not get into specific technologies here, but you know, there's a ton of like cheaper CRMs out there you can use. So, and these, these boring technologies are critical to your business. So just thinking about infrastructure along the way is really important. That's not the answer to your question, but I just wanted to get that in there. Um, the answer to your question though, really, I think is this North Star issue, which is like, what, what mission are you on? Um, and that, you know, keeping that and holding that and knowing that when, when the world goes south and we have a huge crisis like we have had, that you know what your mission is and there might be an entirely new way to get to that mission because of the way the world around you has changed. So holding to your North Star and paying attention to the world around you will get you where you need to go. Thank you. That's, um, you know, definitely it's going to be an inspiration for all of us over here, I guess. And uh, so um, one last question before we end the session. So um, what do you think the future of the healthcare management is going to be like? What do you foresee from now, five years from now? Let's take it a shorter time or as five years. So how do you see it's going to improve? Well, first, I think um, uh, what you're doing today in science is going to be a game changer for how we start to think about everything related to our health. And you all see it already, right, in terms of uh, those of us worried well who are constantly, you know, checking our, our, uh, our stats on ourselves um, or uh, now looking at, gosh, what have we learned about COVID and why is COVID affecting some people more than others? The entire country has just woken up to the field of genomics and proteomics and all the omics, right? That's more your territory than mine. Um, but we're going to see, I mean, you know, pharma's back in favor and everyone's, I shouldn't say everyone, that's not true, but um, science is starting to really be the definer of health. So I think that's going to be huge. Um, and I think we'll see a lot more kind of uh, personal sensor use and the like um, that will happen even through, um, you know, our health planner, our health system, our provider. Um, and I think the this care in the home, um, virtual access, we're going to really work through in a big way over the next five years, what can be virtual and what should not be virtual and why. We're not going to be anywhere near a complete definition, but I think we'll make a lot of headway on primary care and a lot of headway in some of these spaces that have been, that are big dollars, like musculoskeletal, big dollars. A lot of that can be done in the home with centers and physical therapists online. So, you know, thinking about that and then the last one, and I know we need to go, um, I think we're going to see a whole new level. We've been talking about care teams for years. I think we'll see a whole new level of coaching that is coming from places that are different than our doctor, or we'll see a lot of practices, perhaps like a One Medical or a Maven or something else, 
um, that leverages a coaching model to really address what our needs are between visits. So I think we're going to start to see a more kind of continuous experience for those of us who are engaging um, in healthcare for our health. So there's so much more I could say on that topic, uh, but those are sort of three vectors to be thinking about. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. And um, it was a really a good session. Now I give it over to Doug. Thank you so much, Julie, for taking the time today to talk with our students and our audience. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you and have a great rest of your day, everyone.